Hello everybody, welcome to the American Dream. Today we have a special guest by the name of Drew Russo, who is the Executive Director of Lynn Museum, Lynn Arts. Uh, welcome, Drew. Thanks, Drew. Thanks for having me. You, you're welcome. And we have a special co-interviewer. You all know, I'm sure, Thor Jurgensen, the, the news editor at the Daily Item. Uh, so he's going to ask questions of Drew, as am I. Uh, and Drew, you can ask any questions you want. There we go. You can say anything you want on this show. It's, we're easy. So how is the Lynn Museum? I think the Lynn Museum is doing very, very well. Um, we are really proud, along with Lynn Arts, uh, to be in the hub of the downtown Lynn Cultural District. That's one organization, is that? So we came together uh, in 2014. Um, you know, the museum obviously has been around since 1897 right. uh, when the Historical Society was founded. In 1913, moved over to Green Street, uh, where it was for, 80, for 93 years. Uh, and then in a partnership with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, moved into the Heritage State Park Visitors Center in 2014, uh, 2006. But it so was still the, the Lynn Museum at that point. It was still the Lynn Museum okay. at that point. And then Lynn Arts, uh, has been at 25 Exchange Street for over 20 years, and the two entities merged together in 2014. So it's now one entity. It's one okay. organization right. okay. with one common board of trustees. Right. Okay. Okay. So what's going on? A lot's going on right now. Um, at the museum, we have some exciting new exhibits. We've totally refreshed our exhibits over the last year. Uh, industry and craft, people at work in Lynn, uh, takes a look at you know, work here in the city from the time of ice and flax making to the advent of the 10-footer shoe shop, the industrial revolution and the rise of the shoe industry, uh, General Electric coming in as a major player, as well as uh, some of the work that, that public service employees, people like firefighters and nurses, have done to contribute to the local economy here in the city. And that's the linchpin of our uh, public school program, our multi-visit program, which last year uh, had 450 third grade students come through the museum in a curriculum based program and this spring we welcomed almost 500 students from the Lynn public great. schools. What's the mission of, of the museum? So our mission really is to preserve the city's history um, and to provide uh, a window on its past and uh, hopefully you know use the lessons of that past to help provide a vision for the city's future and then you look at Lynn Arts uh, our opportunity there is to really give local artists an opportunity uh, to hang and create and sell their works, but also to bring different forms of art in. Arts After Hours is a wonderful program. Uh, Corey Jackson is the managing director. You and I have a number of friends in common that are involved with that board, and they bring live professional quality theater to our Neil Rantoul Vault Theater twice mm -hmm. a year. So really it's an opportunity to bring history, arts, and culture uh, to downtown Lynn. Great. Thor. Jim, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I've Love never you. had a boring conversation with Drew, so this is exciting. <laughs> the, the High expectations. How do you think that makes me feel? <laughs> <laughs> you too. The most interesting part of any story is all the personalities that are at play behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I've always been fascinated by what group of people or individuals came together to not only revitalize the museum, but bring together this concept and partnership of Lynn Arts working in tandem with the museum? Well, it was a great executive director, and that was a great executive director that was my predecessor, Kate Lucchini, uh, who did an amazing job working with um, our multi-talented uh, and diverse, uh, intellectually diverse board of trustees, people like Joe Scanlon and Steve Babbitt, uh, Deborah Smith-Walsh, uh, Steve Rima, uh, Richard Kessel, Steve Walsh on the Lynn Arts side, uh, who did an amazing job and actually brought me into Lynn Arts as a student at St. Mary's 20 years ago. Uh, Mark Kennard, Joe Boyd, really coming together uh, to say, look, we have two amazing cultural institutions in the downtown. We will be better and stronger and fulfill our mission better for the city by being one. Um, and it was a wonderful opportunity for me uh, after uh, my last professional endeavor uh, to really be able to come home and do something great in my hometown uh, and to be able to work with those people to steward the further development of this organization. But it really is because of a lot of those people I mentioned, our members, uh, and tremendous community supporters, including the both of you uh, who have been participants in our programs and have supported us through the years. What sort of challenges and hurdles did you have to overcome? You're talking about a lot of people 
who have pretty dynamic personalities. Well, I mean, I think that you know, in in any in any endeavor like this, you're always going to to run into some disagreements about how you move forward. But the great thing that I've always loved about working with these trustees is that they are mission-centered and mission-focused. Uh, and they wanted to make sure that we built an organization that not only curated the city's history, but allowed for new art to be created. Um, and it's a wonderful fusion of energy that I think has really allowed us to succeed. Not to say that there aren't challenges and disagreements sometimes, but, but there's a common sense of mission and purpose uh, that really allows us to succeed and to, to continue building. How often do you have programs? We Open have, to the public. Like, for example, when, when I leave here today, we've got our Mesa program, which is the museum enrichment series for adults. It's a brown bag lunch. Uh, we do that monthly. We do that nine out of 12 months of the year. Uh, we take some time off in the winter and in the spring. Uh, we've got a great program. What's coming. the subject of today's uh, discussion? Actually, it is a, uh, an, a historian, Sarah Madeline Tierney Guerin, who's going to come and talk about the advent of the 10-footer shoe shop, including uh, the 10-footer that we have as part of the Heritage State Park property. Um, and it, you know, last month, uh, we had a woman that came in and talked about sort of different forms of art therapy. We've had people come in and talk about uh, the Civil War, uh, you know, the role of women in the early Coast Guard. So really interesting historical topics and sometimes some art projects uh, that really you know, bring people together and uh, give them an opportunity to engage the museum in a new and interesting way. How do you promote these to the public? So we have a number of uh, we have a number of vehicles by which we do that. Uh, you know, obviously we are really investing a lot in social media. We have over five thousand followers on Facebook. Uh, we tweet. Saw that. We yeah, tweet. Congratulations. We do Instagram. Uh, we have a robust mailing list. Uh, we still do snail mailings to our members. Uh, the Daily Item and the Lynn Journal and other LynnHappens.com uh, give us great coverage for our events. And right. you know, we're not always perfect. You know, we we always can get better in terms of communication. Uh, but but I think that we're on the right track. Most of these events are free, right? A good number of them are. Um, you know, for example, we have to pay the bills just like any other nonprofit does. Uh, and for example, you know, we do a number of fundraisers through the course of the year. But we do those things to try to keep as much programming as we can uh, free and accessible to the public. Uh, you know, one exception to that that's coming up is we are doing a program that I'm very excited about on Thursday, June 1st, uh, with former uh, mayor and postmaster Tom Coston, who had a very special relationship, as we all know, uh, with President John F. Kennedy and the Kennedy family. This is the centennial of JFK's birth. And so Ted Grant, the publisher of Essex Media Group, is going to moderate a conversation with Tom. Um, and Tom said, I want to, and Tom, typical of his generosity, said, I want this to be something that benefits the museum. Um, and Ted absolutely agreed with that. And so we put a modest ticket price on it, $35. Two for uh, 50. Two for 50. $35 because, obviously, Kennedy was the 35th right. president. Um, but we really Too do. Too bad he wasn't the 60th, huh? Continue your life. We are in interesting times, but um, but but you know. So sometimes we do things like that, but we try to provide as much free programming as possible. Yeah, Our free good. family days yeah. are a great option. Um, we had 150 people uh, over April vacation that really reflected. Um, the diverse tapestry of cultural life in this city. Uh, coming in for our Curious Creatures program, doing Earth Day projects, and engaging with our exhibits. It also allows us to do the public school program free of charge to the students. I'm thinking of events I've been to at the museum, and every one has been a different type of an event. An anniversary, or mm -hmm. an art show, or a lecture, just the range of different activities is really incredible, and an aspect I think that uh, you're growing is as a venue for weddings and more social events like that as well? Well, we really have, and, and you know, it's interesting. We have become, uh, you know, a, a destination for community events, including some of the ones that you've mentioned. And I think some people say, well, you know, you're a museum. Is that, is that detract from your mission to be doing events? I don't think it does, because every time we have an event rental in the building, <laughs> you're seeing 100, 150, 200 people come in, many of whom haven't encountered the museum before, many of whom didn't know that a museum existed in their own city. And they say, wow, I right. didn't know this was here. And then they go, 
and we get memberships out of that. We yeah. get you know financial contributions in addition to the rental rates. So let's talk about rent. Yeah, Ann and I were at your building this morning, mm -hmm. and we were, we walked around outside. Just beautiful, mm -hmm. uh, great place to have a party. So what do you charge? So uh, during the week, our standard rate. Uh, is about $150 an hour, so 600 for a four-hour rental. So that would be Monday through Wednesday. Is that a minimum of four hours? It's a minimum of four hours. Yeah. Um, and then uh, our standard rate Thursday through Sunday is $800 or $200 an hour. Okay. How are your finances and what is your perspective le uh, going, say, five years forward? It's, well, it's, it's interesting that you should say that. Um, you know, for an arts and cultural organization, finances are always a challenge. Uh, they are a challenge for us. Uh, luckily, due to the financial generosity of people that came well before me and well before any of us, we have a relatively healthy endowment. Um, you know, it's an endowment that during fiscal downturns took a little bit of a hit, but for an institution our size, it performs very well. We've increased our fundraising, but we still need to do more in terms of, you know, rent from rental revenue. Uh, you know, we do a lot of fundraising events, building an annual appeal, grants, and one of the things that our board has just green-lighted uh, is the second phase of a a strategic planning process that will put together a five-year plan uh, that really looks at two different things. One, how do we become fiscally sustainable and how do we increase our relevance in the community and we're going to be doing more community engagement to get more feedback on that uh, during the fall. This is a general question all three of us can contemplate because we all three work downtown. How can the museum and Lynn Arts uh, create a dynamic that maybe brings in the Grand Army, the Republic Building, the events in Veterans Memorial Auditorium, and just the presence of schools in the city to really uh, continue to change and revitalize downtown. I mean, that's a question asked in different ways mm -hmm. for decades, but it seems there's an energy there now that has not been there before, in my view. And I think that one of the reasons for that is really the, um, the energy that's been put into the development of the downtown Lynn Cultural District. Um, you know, Kate Lucchini, who I talked about a few minutes She's ago. She's my stepdaughter, by the way. <laughs> Thank she, you for full yeah. disclosure. <laughs> I was aware, but, but and a very you know, talented woman. She was, uh, our direct, she was our director and brought in Carolyn Cole. They did a tremendous job. Now Carolyn has stepped into the director's role, and they're really doing a great job of working to bring a lot of those cultural assets together, raw artworks, uh, you know, some of the new businesses downtown like Pick Up Modern and More on Exchange Street, uh, the White Rose, Land of a Thousand Hills, uh, groups like Arts After Hours, Cultural Latina Dance Academy. Um, we've actually had a good collaboration at the museum with the GAR Museum. We had a lecture series last year that was funded right. by the Lynn Cultural Council. I just went to the uh, 20th anniversary of the General Lander Civil War Roundtable because we have some artifacts uh, JR artifacts in our collection. So making sure that we build those relationships and those partnerships uh, to show that, you know, we really are trying to row in the same direction and build a stronger sense of cultural community in the downtown. To address part of your question, I would run every single class I could through that museum. It, maybe one or two classes at a mm -hmm. time, have a brief lecture, question and answer session with you and teachers outside speakers, mm -hmm. great opportunity for kids to learn about their city that they don't get in the classroom, I don't believe. And, I, uh, and that's why the pilot program with, with LPS is so important, and Dr. Latham has been a supportive of this from the beginning. One of the first meetings that I had when I became two, director two years ago was with her, um, and we're always looking for more funding because to bring, you know, there's transportation costs associated, you want to develop curriculum, um, and we've been really fortunate. The Gerondulus Foundation and Tom Demarcus uh, both stepped up in a big way for us. Uh, the Lynn Cultural Council, the Essex National Heritage Area just gave us a grant. We're constantly looking for new sources of funding so we can expand that program and bring as many Lynn Public School students as we can in, not to mention the many other schools we have in the yeah, city. Yeah, what about St. Mary's, Mary's Kip, Sacred Heart, you know, always looking to develop those new relationships. It's there's so much potential, knowing the museum and Lynn Arts, to bring in young people in the city and really expand on what they're learning in school or what their interests are, right. and to give people a chance to pique their interests. And it's interesting, 
um, though I don't know a lot about it, this Jazz is a Rainbow program in production in August is an innovative kind of idea. And, and, you know, again, that was community relationships, you know, Michael. So prior to my coming to the museum, I worked uh, for Congressman John Tierney uh, for a number of years, and I was at St. Mary's before that. So, you know, I have constantly, you know, been able to, um, you know, re-engage different relationships that I had. One of those relationships that I built when I worked for Congressman Tierney uh, was with Mike Palter, who was part of a jazz trio that was very familiar to us. Uh, and he uh, approached us in the fall of 2015 about bringing jazz as a rainbow back to Lynn. Um, and Alex Newell, who I think is known to many people locally, Lynn Kidd, who achieved a measure of success on Glee, was a jazz as a rainbow graduate. And wow. with jazz as a rainbow, they come in, these, these young people come into Lynn Arts for two weeks in August. They go through an intensive uh, performance workshop and they perform uh, for two nights. Last uh, year it was the Harlem Strut, so stories and songs of the Harlem Renaissance. Most of it original music written by Mike Palter and his wife Lynn Jackson, uh, who are noted jazz musicians locally. And this year they're doing Let Freedom Sing, songs of the civil rights movement. And it was so interesting to me last year um, that most of the participants in the cast were actually recent African immigrants to this country, hmm. that this was really in many ways their first sustained exposure to the Harlem Renaissance and the civil rights movement. Um, and you could see sort of how they came alive and the development of talent. Some of these kids were so shy to even sing in the bathroom when they started this process and they just did tremendously at the end of this two week experience. So is, are the workshops open to the public or just the two performances? No, no, no. The performances are open to the public. Anybody can audition for the workshop. Any student um, in the Lynn Public Schools, I think it's 13 and up, um, can, can. So they go into the middle schools and they go into the high schools uh, to promote. And, um, you know, they have auditions. But, those, but anybody can audition. Not everybody can make right. the cast. Right. But they try to take as many students as they can. Okay. The fascinating part about that whole potential experience is that when you think of museum, you think of something kind of dusty, don't touch stuff, you got to be quiet, and, and you're talking about an experience that's the opposite of that. Here, come in, don't worry about any training or anything, check it out and become a performer or an artist. Well, <laughs> we still do have concern about the collection and things like that. Uh, I, I know, I my, know that. The collection but, staff would, would but, but I think... I think you're, what you're hitting on is that we are really trying to make it a vibrant, interactive experience, and we have a magnificent collection. Over 10,000 objects um, that have been lovingly contributed you know, over the years, in the 120 years since the Historical Society was formed, and those objects tell a pretty compelling story about the city. Where do you keep them all? Uh, well, we have a couple of different places. One, most of the tangible objects are in the museum, which is a climate-controlled space, uh, both on our third floor and in our basement area, which is one of the great aspects to that building. It's a climate-controlled building. Um, and then four years ago, we entered into a partnership with the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. Uh, so our map and library archive is on um, temporary deposit for 10 to 25 years over there. Um, and the great thing about the collaboration with PEM is that all of our materials are now part of their Philcat catalog. So somebody can search the Lynn Historical Collection online, which makes their own research uh, a lot easier. Well, that's true. Do you have a favorite exhibit or item? Do I have a favorite exhibit or item? You know, we. That's, that's a tough one. I mean, there's so much good stuff in the collection. I think the one thing that we have up right now, which I didn't mention in my little go around at the beginning, was um, we have a little homage to the Lynn Theaters. Um, you know, the Comique, the Capitol Theater, which was the Central Square Theater, the Warner, the Paramount. Um, and I remember, you know, some of my earliest memories are of my Nana who grew up in different places around Summer Street and the Brickyard during the Depression, talking about how you know, those movie theaters gave her and her friends joy as a kid. You know, that was sort of their, 
Sure. Uh, that was their release from the, the, the horrors of the depression. And so I think of her very fondly every time I walk in to that space. And it's one of our most popular areas mm. because it really does conjure up a lot of warm memories uh, for folks that, that were alive and were kids during that heyday of theaters in Lynn, before radio, before television, before you know the advent of all of these technological mediums in our homes. Well, we had radio. Though. Well, all right, I'm sorry. <laughs> I th as soon as I said that, I, thought, oh, I shouldn't uh, say radio. I, but I was just going to say, I, I, I didn't grow up during the Depression, but uh, I came shortly afterwards. And we had the Uptown, the, the Uppy, mm -hmm. uh, no, and we had the auditorium. You could go to the movie on a Saturday afternoon for 10 cents. And for that time, you could get two feature movies, one seri serial, you know, like mm -hmm. Buck Rogers, every week you'd see Buck Rogers, a couple of cartoons, and the news <laughs> for a dime. It was amazing. <laughs> Good. Look ahead five years for Lynn Arts and the museum. What do you see, or, and what would you want? I think what I would like to see is um, basically what we're trying to chart toward right now, more consistent programming, um, you know, a vision for where we're going to go forward with our collection and sort of what we need to focus on collecting so we can conserve the city's history the best way that we can. Obviously more revenue and, um, you know, making sure that we have a stable, you know, stable fiscal model uh, going forward, more constant communication. and. And I think most importantly, you know, this is and always has been a tremendously diverse city. Um, you know, we really derive so much strength from the different cultures that make up the rich tapestry of what Lynn is. We can do a better job of that outreach. And we've definitely tried, but I think five years from now, um, you know, I, my hope would be that our membership and our programs and you know, our foot traffic is really much more reflective of the city as a whole than it is today. Yeah. So how are you going to do that? I think it's really going out and talking to people. And, you know, you actually did something great that you invited me to last year about, um, about board diversity and bringing different people from the community in. And I think that, you know, it's, it's not just demographics, but it's it's different sorts of levels of experience too and different gifts that people bring to bear. The more conversations we have, the more classrooms we can get into, I think that the better off we'll be in terms of being a richer, more vibrant community resource. So you, you derive rental from, from the museum. You, mm -hmm. you couldn't open it up for space, for community space. Is that yes or no? In, in what sense? Well, suppose a cultural organization Mm -hmm. they didn't they don't have much money they need place to meet would you allow them to meet there we, we could I mean we definitely yeah. we've worked with different organizations yeah. on that before you know I'm like I said to, we we try yeah. to be we try to be a community space as much as we right. possibly can and we understand that I mean but we're also a nonprofit and so we always have to sort of manage those Kate things and I ran a, a couple of programs there mm -hmm. as you know and I think you were there uh, and we termed them we the Lynn Museum where history comes alive mm -hmm. And I think that makes it more relevant to those people who think, why would I go to a museum? The Tom Coston uh, is, uh, show is a perfect example. Uh, he is enormously uh, entertaining. Fascinating he, guy. Uh, yeah. he's, he knows a great deal. I had him on this show one time years ago, and he was unbelievable. Uh, in fact, I'll try to get you a tape of that show if you want a preview of what mm. you're going to see. But he's just great. But you, you, and you're gonna charge for that. You could do that with other speaker programs, I think, related to land, related to the museum, but also related to current events. That's right. We could do one on maybe impeachments or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's we, actually so one of the- He really wants to talk politics. No, 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 I'm not <laughs> going. I never do here, you know, I never do. <laughs> the Beacon Chevy site, mm -hmm. where, where talk of uh, residential development is not cooled down, but quieted mm -hmm. down a little. There was always an arrangement, if I recall, for that property where there would be a land swap with that land right in Central Square adjacent to the museum in return for a right away on that site right off the Linway opposite the college. Do you have any sense of the status of that? So, I mean, it's, it's um, I, you know, I had a meeting about that um, as recently as a year ago, um, and the sense that I get is that DCR will take over that land uh, if that does occur. And the plan is, and these are plans that have been uh, in formation for quite a while, would be to extend the park out to the street. So there is a park um, that's fenced in 
from the museum that goes from the end of the museum probably to right to right before the railroad bridge in Central Square. The lot would then go out all the way to the corner of Exchange Street, um, which would create a much bigger park uh, and open space for public use. But I also think that it provides more connectivity for the two campuses. So, so we're still hopeful, and I think that- But that, um, that land is still owned by the Beacon, people who own Beacon- uh, it's, it's, owned, it's owned by a, it's owned by a, um, it's owned by a private citizen, and I'm not necessarily sure of how the mechanics work. I just know that I think once the Beacon Chevrolet site goes online, the next step is for that property to be developed as a park. At least that's the sense In right now. In return for clearing up a right-of-way situation. That's my I understanding. Think. Yeah, yeah. Right. as is mine without being overly authoritative. Are you in a position where space-wise the museum and Lynn Arts needs more building space at some point? I mean, we're very fortunate right now in that um, we're at pretty close to full occupancy in the Lynn Arts building. And, um, you know, we are very well utilizing the space in the Lynn Museum building, which is part of the reason that we entered into that collaboration with the Peabody Essex, because um, it gave us some little, a little bit of breathing space in terms of how we could store our collection. Um, but, you know, there's always, Whenever you're in any sort of planning process, you take a look at your facilities too. Um, and you know, there could be areas of the building. I think about the black box, you know, the Neil Rantoul Vault Theater, which is a great asset for the city. Like I said, Arts After Hours, North Shore Community College, which is a great partner of ours, KIPP Academy, all use that to stage productions. Um, you know, I would love to see us be able to do something with that. Uh, and so that could become a funding priority for us, conceivably. Okay. We're going to have to wrap this up. So do you have any other questions? Thor? I got 10 of them, but I'm going to wrap it up here. It's been fascinating. OK, Jerry, what about you? you got I, I'm just say? very glad to have the opportunity and would invite people to come and visit us Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 4, Saturdays, 9 to 1. One final question on the rent. What about the outside? How much do you charge to rent uh, during the summer? It's a beautiful spot. And well used. Um, it really goes along with the same price structure oh, that okay. I talked about okay. before. Okay. Because it does involve inside, outside right, access right. to Especially the if it rains. Yeah, particularly if it rains. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Drew and thank Thor. You, thank you. Thank well, you. It's a pleasure working Quite. with both of you. Good luck. Thank you. And, uh, the item is giving you good publicity, so you should be.